Hello, welcome everybody. This is the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists teleconference. I'm John Mecklin. I'm the editor in chief of the Bulletin, and today we have a, a great conversation with for you with two top experts. We'll be talking about nuclear weapons policy in the 2020 presidential campaign, which hits a possible inflection point tomorrow, as we all know, with Super Tuesday. With us today are John Holdren and Alexandra Bell. As I'm sure many of you know, John was President Obama's science advisor and director of the White House Office of Science and Technology. He's a professor now at the Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Alex Bell is a senior policy director at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. She's also served in the Obama administration as a senior advisor on arms control and international security. Uh, we'll have about 20 minutes of conversation here with John and Alex, and then we'll move to some brilliant questions from you folks who are on the teleconference today. Uh, I'm asking the operator now to step in and tell you how you can line up to ask your questions. During the question and answer session, you may ask a question by pressing star than one on your touchdown phone. If you would like to remove yourself from the queue, you may press star than two. Again, it's star than one if you have a question. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for that. And we do want this to be a conversation, so as we talk amongst ourselves for 20 minutes or so, please do line up to ask your questions because we want to hear what what you want to know so we can address it. Uh, uh, John, I'm going to throw to you first, I think. Uh, you wrote a piece for our latest edition of the Bulletin uh, arguing that the United States should move to a no first use of nuclear weapons policy. Uh, I wonder if you could recap that argument sort of for our audience today and sort of try to explain why it is, why should that be a big issue in the presidential campaign? Sure. Uh, happy to do that. Uh, first of all, I think it's important for everybody to understand that the existing policy of the United States and NATO is first use of nuclear weapons if necessary. That means that we are willing to initiate the use of nuclear weapons against not only nuclear attacks, but against attacks with conventional weapons or biological weapons. Uh, this policy is uh, basically an artifact of the Cold War, when it was believed that the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact Alliance had conventional forces in Europe that were greatly superior to the forces that NATO deployed in Europe. Uh, and the argument was, we need to threaten the use of nuclear weapons against a conventional attack in order to deter the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, from launching such an attack. I think that argument was questionable in the first place, but it certainly lost all relevance at the end of the Cold War when the conventional forces in the possession of Russia, the former Soviet Union, uh, were no longer superior. In fact, they uh, were drastically inferior to the conventional forces commanded uh, by the NATO alliance. Um, one of the problems with uh, the notion of first use if necessary is that it falls under a rubric that nuclear weapons experts call extended deterrence. And extended deterrence has two forms of extension. One is the extension of our nuclear deterrence to cover nuclear threats against our allies, not just against the United States. The other form of extension is extending nuclear deterrence to cover not just nuclear threats, but conventional and biological threats. And it is the second form of extension that the no first use case seeks to halt. That is the policy of first use of nuclear weapons against conventional or, or, or biological threats is extremely risky, far out of proportion to its benefits. 
if we were to abandon the threat to use nuclear weapons first against conventional or biological threats, we would, uh, among other benefits, very greatly strengthen the U.S. position against proliferation of nuclear weapons. It would reduce the incentives of potential adversaries that don't have nuclear weapons to acquire them, and it would reduce the risks of nuclear use through accident or miscalculation. It would also avoid and render unnecessary the continuous striving to develop and deploy nuclear capabilities that would make U.S. nuclear first use against a nuclear-armed adversary advantageous and therefore credible if, in fact, the attack was not with nuclear weapons. Uh, we have uh, seen, uh, since the end of the Cold War, a basic failure by the United States and other nuclear weapon states to devalue the currency of nuclear weapons in world affairs. This is something that President Obama pledged to do in his famous Prague speech uh, of 2009. Uh, but by failing to embrace a policy of no first use, we basically skipped the biggest opportunity to devalue that currency by reducing the scope of the rationale for U.S. nuclear forces to a narrow uh, deterrent function, namely deterring other countries who have nuclear weapons from using theirs or threatening to use them. Uh, we have m much cheaper and much safer ways to deal with conventional or biological attacks than responding with nuclear weapons and thereby very likely launching a much more widespread nuclear war. That threat is simply not worth it. Okay, and that, uh, I mean, it's a, a very compelling argument, and I, I'm not sure how much how much you can answer this and how much detail, but obviously the Obama administration discussed the possibility of using to, going to no first use and then did not change the U.S. policy to no first use. Uh, you were in the administration. Uh, how, much, how much can you say about how that happened? Well, I'd say a couple of things. Uh, every uh, presidential administration uh, reviews U.S. nuclear policy and posture. Uh, and it was reviewed uh, in the uh, first Obama term. And what you find uh, when those reviews take place is that there are divergent views within the military and across the wider security community about the value or lack of it of a posture of first use of nuclear weapons against conventional or biological threats. Uh, and so uh, what happened in the Obama administration is the process uh, of a nuclear posture review took place uh, and the initial inclination of the president uh, with some commentary from him was to let that uh, nuclear posture review run its course. And in the end, the, uh, the principal architects of that uh, nuclear posture review did not recommend changing the policy. I wish they had, but they didn't. That led to a continuing uh, discussion uh, in uh, the White House and the National Security Council with representation uh, by all of the members of the National Security Council. That includes the Secretary of Defense, the Vice President, the Secretary of Energy, uh, and so on. And again, there were diverse views reflected. Uh, my uh, impression was certainly that President Obama wanted to take no first use seriously, but in the end, uh, that conversation went on for a long time and then uh, ran out of time because it was uh, the conviction that if we were to move to a posture of no first use uh, against conventional and biological weapons, that would require extensive consultation with uh, our allies. Uh, that would include uh, the European countries. It would include Japan. It would include South Korea. 
and the impression was that that would be a time-consuming process of consultation. And since at that time, everybody expected that Hillary Clinton would win the presidency in the 2016 uh, election, uh, it was uh, decided that it was too late in the Obama administration to conduct the extensive uh, discussions that would be required. And so it was left to the presumed Hillary Clinton administration uh, to take that issue up again. Uh, again, uh, we were all surprised, I think, by the outcome of the 2016 election uh, in which Hillary Clinton was not elected. Donald Trump was. And there has been no interest expressed in the Trump administration in a posture of no first use. Uh, I think that's very uh, unfortunate uh, because, again, I think the uh, a change in the U.S. posture, which I believe could gain the agreement of all of our allies, uh, would actually strengthen uh, the barriers against nuclear use and escalation into a widespread nuclear war, would strengthen our nonproliferation policy, uh, reduce the chance of nuclear war by accident or miscalculation. It would be a bargain. Okay, I'll go. Thanks so much for that, and obviously we'll come back to that and many other issues shortly. First, I want to tell you, Alex, and you know, if you could recap for us what what arms control uh, landscape looks like right now, and uh, you know how that ties into or could or should tie into the presidential campaign. Absolutely. Uh, again, thank you for having me. Uh, the long and short of it is the President of the United States, no matter who it is, uh, has the complete and unchecked authority over the 4,000 nuclear weapons in the active U.S. stockpile. Uh, that President must also lead efforts to control and mitigate the risks of the roughly 10,000 other nuclear weapons uh, located around the world. So anyone running for President is asking the American public to trust them with this absolutely daunting test. That's why the press and the, sh and the public should be asking about these issues uh, throughout the course of this election year. Uh, there are multiple nuclear crises unfolding around us in real time. That includes strategic stability talks, a possible dialogue with Russia and China, uh, proliferation crises in Iran and North Korea, nuclear tensions in South Asia, and the erosion of the international framework that has kept nuclear risks in check and at bay for the last 75 years. And these nuclear crises are all linked with broader security issues. Uh, for example, relations with Russia, which are currently at I mean, their worst point since the end of the Cold War, uh, could go from, from bad to unimaginably terrible in the absence of verifiable bilateral controls over the U.S. and Russian strategic arsenals. If we do not extend the New START Treaty by February 5, 2021, this is our likely future. Uh, it's also hard to envision a successful economic pivot to Asia that doesn't involve a long-term solution to the crisis on the Korean Peninsula and a better strategic stability relationship between the United States and China. Uh, as a reminder of this ongoing threat, uh, Kim Jong-un sent a reminder last night in the form of two short-range ballistic missile launches. Uh, getting the military budget under control is impossible without taking a hard look at the nearly $1.7 trillion as adjusted for inflation that the United States is planning to spend on modernizing U.S. nuclear forces. And the latest Trump administration budget pro proposal uh, you know, is likely to keep that number climbing if it's enacted uh, as requested. Uh, without arms control and nonproliferation agreements, that budget will continue to balloon. Uh, there is no peace in the Middle East without constraints on weapons of mass destruction in the region. And uh, as I said in my article, uh, the next president is going to have to deal with a fundamental question. Are we going to live in a world where the number of nuclear weapons is going up or going down? And uh, in addition to questions uh, of launch uh, authority and force posture that Dr. Holdren talked about, um, there will be this issue of where we're going with arms control and nonproliferation agreements. As of today, President Trump is on track to be the only president since President Kennedy that has neither started nor completed a formal arms control agreement uh, in their first four years in office. He has, however, dropped out of a couple of agreements. Uh, so no matter who's 
going to be sitting behind that resolute desk on January 20th, 2021, will have to scramble to triage the challenges that have been left to them on the arms control and nonproliferation front, the most pressing of which is, as I mentioned, the extension of the New START Treaty, uh, nearly uh, as important and nearly uh, and much more difficult will be how the president plans to deal with what's left of the joint comprehensive plan of action with Iran and deciding what comes next. There's also the matter of what comes next with North Korea. Uh, this president had an opportunity uh, to potentially make a deal with the North Koreans that has uh, not produced any results uh, of note and the situation could get increasingly worse over the next year. Uh, the next president will also have to deal with entirely new issues in the arms control and nonproliferation front, uh, including the emergence of uh, new technologies that have the ability to upset strategic stability, um, artificial intelligence being one of those issues. Uh, so for the past half century, uh, American presidents have been, of uh, both political parties, have been creating an intricate collection of arms control and nonproliferation agreements. And uh, while not perfect, those agreements have helped us come down from a, a peak of 70,000 nuclear weapons to about the 14,000 that are in the world today. Um, if we lose these agreements, we are definitely heading for a world where the number of nuclear weapons goes back up. Uh, so that's exactly why this should be a major issue in the 2020 election cycle. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that, Alex. Uh, and I think I'm picking up that, you know, all three of us think uh, the nuclear situation is pretty serious and perhaps the most important general issue facing the country and potential presidential candidates. Uh, you've both had experience with the major press, national press, international press. It, it seems to me that generally the press does not do a particularly good job of covering the nuclear threat and explaining it to the citizenry at large. And I, I'm wondering if, if, if you have any idea what why that is and how, how we might change that, how, how we might get better coverage for the general public of nuclear issues so they are discussed in things like presidential campaigns. John, you, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do, I do have a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is that uh, we do get some good coverage of nuclear threats from some of the major newspapers. Uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, the L.A. Times, the Chicago Tribune, all have had from time to time very good coverage. But part of the problem is that a large part of the public lost interest in uh, nuclear weapon issues at the end of the Cold War. People simply assumed with the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the former Soviet Union that nuclear weapon threats had evaporated. Uh, that is not the case, uh, but uh, it uh, certainly contributed to a uh, reduction in the interest uh, on the public's part of reading uh, these analyses of nuclear weapon issues, which tended, for the most part, to be on page 17. Uh, the, the second point I would mention is that we uh, live increasingly in a soundbite and Twitter culture. And it is uh, difficult to explain the intricacies of nuclear threats in uh, 240 characters or uh, a soundbite uh, on a news program. And uh, part of the problem associated with that, I often note, is that one can tell a lie in a single sentence that takes three paragraphs to rebut, and you generally don't get the three paragraphs. Uh, so there are a number of reasons that uh, I think we have uh, not succeeded in explaining uh, to the American public the extent to which the nuclear weapon threat is still very real and the extent to which there are uh, very important steps that need to be taken in order to avoid that threat becoming even worse. Yeah, uh, Alex, has that kind of been your experience, or do, do you see any other things going on out there that are, are making it? it? It seems like it's, it's getting increasingly more difficult to break through with 
the message that the world is a dangerous place because of nuclear weapons? Uh, that's certainly been uh, my issue, and I spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill uh, talking with staff about these issues. And, and the big problem is there's so many issues to worry about uh, that nuclear issues, unless there's sort of a, a high-level crisis, North Korea tests a nuclear weapon, for example, uh, these, these issues tend to go on the back burner. And what I'm always trying to do uh, is remind people that this is actually a, a, a kind of issue zero if we don't get – nuclear nonproliferation and arms control agreement issues right, um, then nothing else matters. Uh, the, the existential threat that nuclear weapons pose uh, to every human on this planet uh, deserves time and attention. Uh, I agree also with Dr. Holdren that it's, it's hard to get some of these issues across in 280 character bursts. They do require some nuance, but I also think it's incumbent uh, on nuclear experts to use language that is more accessible, and, and I think it's something that the community has been striving to do, um, to talk about these things in, in terms that are more easily accessible. Uh, but one thing I've noticed that the press has done is they tend to get distracted um, by, you know, issues that are important but sort of uh, tangential to the core threats we're facing. For example, in recent debates, uh, moderators have asked Democratic candidates, uh, you know, would you meet directly with Kim Jong-un? And while that is an important issue and, and part of a strategy of how a candidate would deal with the North Korean nuclear program, what's really more important is how candidates would build upon the lessons learned from the 1994 agreed framework and from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran and use those lessons learned to build their own policies for trying to get their arms around the North Korean nuclear program. It's far more important than whether or not they'd meet directly uh, with the chairman. So I, I hope that uh, people, both President Trump and the candidates running for the Democratic nomination, will get asked specific questions on how they need to handle and will handle nuclear threats. Yeah, it, it would be a, a great improvement if just for the debates, and there will be debates once the Democrats choose a, you know, their nominee, uh, it would be a great improvement in my mind. If there were just a serious nuclear question in every debate, you know, it, you know, and not just a will you meet with Kim Jong Un, but uh, you know, that's uh, just a hope, and we'll see how that goes. I, I was wondering, we, we've had a, a little bit of an introductory talk here now, and I was wondering if the operator could uh, cue us into if, if there are any questions lined up for our guests to to answer here. Thank you. Our first question today comes from Dan Leon in Exchange Modern Republication. Please go ahead. Yeah, hey, everybody. Thanks for, for having the call and, and for letting me join. Uh, I, I watch most often the Department of Energy complex, the, the actual nuclear weapons complex that, that is building these things, and uh, they are getting into the fat part of a cost curve, part of the nuclear modernization you all were talking about. And uh, yeah, you know, with the recognition that the, the the weapons production complex is is getting driven by these higher level requirements that that we've spent some time hearing about this morning, um, I'd nevertheless like to throw out there um, because I, I seldom hear this discussed at all, and it has you know local and national ramifications beyond just um, nuclear weapons use and posture. But uh, should we be rebuilding the weapons production complex post-Cold War at the rate that uh, the Obama and Trump administrations have proposed rebuilding it, and, and and if we should not be doing exactly the things that we're seeing in recent budget requests, what should we do with respect to that complex? Uh, hey, hey, Dan, thanks for that question. It's, it's a good one. Uh, John, how about I throw that to you first? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start on that, and I'm sure Alex will have something to add. But I think the first thing one needs to understand about the uh, nuclear modernization is that it has been seen as a trade uh, in order to get support, uh, political trade, in order to get support of the defense establishment for arms control treaties, for the possibility of ratifying the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, uh, and so on. 
And uh, a lot of people who've gone along with that don't really believe, uh, a lot of informed people who've gone along with that don't really believe that the magnitude of the nuclear modernization is really warranted. They simply have swallowed it uh, as uh, understood to be a necessary uh, trade-off to get support for far-reaching arms control measures. Uh, I think we would be better off with a uh, with a much smaller modernization program. And I would note that if we can find, as we should, the mission of our nuclear weapons to the deterrence of other countries with nuclear weapons, uh, deterring them from using theirs, we would need a much smaller uh, nuclear weapon system, a much smaller nuclear weapon complex. Um, yeah, Alex, what- what do you think about nuclear modernization, just generally? I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, I, I think there were worth, absolutely necessary and worthwhile investments that needed to go into the nuclear infrastructure, which I might remind people had, had sort of that budget and, and attention had atrophied over the course of the, of the Bush administration. And it was the Obama administration that you know, looked at uh, the complex, realized that there were investments that needed to be made. And, and put those into place. But there was a very clear idea that the United States would also be pursuing arms control and nonproliferation agreements and other risk reduction measures uh, simultaneously. And the idea is that we can have a, a safe, secure, and effective arsenal at lower costs, at lower numbers. And what we've seen in the Trump administration is, is they've decided to keep going with the investments in the infrastructure, uh, but completely drop the arms control and nonproliferation side of the equation. The U.S. has obligations under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty to pursue in good faith uh, nuclear reduction measures. And, uh, you know, that's not only people here in the U.S. that expect to see those efforts happening. People around the world expect to see those uh, efforts happening, uh, you know, Arms control and nonproliferation, it's often been said, are two sides of the same coin. If the United States stops pursuing arms control and stops pursuing disarmament, uh, we risk other countries around the world saying, well, there's no reason for us to continue uh, our own commitments to the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty to not pursue a nuclear weapons uh, capability. Uh, we have to keep that in mind going forward. And, uh, and I think that concept should be built into anything that we're doing with the nuclear infrastructure. If I can just add to that uh, one, one point, and that is that if the country with the strongest conventional forces in the world, and that country is the United States, insists that it also needs to threaten the use of nuclear weapons uh, against conventional or biological attacks, it's a message to the rest of the world that, that anybody... Uh, with a less capable conventional uh, set of forces, which is everybody, has a better excuse than the United States for developing nuclear weapons. I mean, it is just a crazy inconsistency with our nonproliferation policy to fail to devalue the currency of nuclear weapons by confining their stated mission to deterrence of nuclear attacks. Thanks for that, John. Yeah, it is uh, a reminder as to how interrelated a lot of these notions are, uh, you know, nuclear modernization and, you know, what you've been talking about with no first use. I mean, they're tied together very, very closely. Uh, let's see. Do, do we have an, another question lined up for us? Absolutely. Our next question comes from David Kramer at Physics Today. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, as you know, the uh, administration has just announced uh, in the next year's budget request the uh, beginning of a, a development for the uh, new warhead. The W-93 would be the first one since the 80s. Um, officials say it will be needed for a new class of uh, ballistic missile submarines that will be coming online in the next decade. Um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, why... It's unclear why that uh, new missile will be needed. I was wondering if anybody could comment on that. Thanks. Uh, since I, I went to John first, but last question, Alex, do, do you know anything about the W-93? <laughs> I, I, 
think I uh, am in the same camp with a lot of people uh, who thinks there's a lot of questions that need to be answered about the W-93. Um, this is uh, an issue that came up in the Strategic Forces Subcommittee meeting uh, of the House Armed Services Committee last week, uh, and it was unclear uh, what exactly this warhead is, how exactly it will be designed. In fact, the uh, STRATCOM commander was asked several times, is this a new warhead, and would not answer in the affirmative or negative. I think that's, that's a question that Congress and the American public deserves an answer to. Uh, and I think, you know, if the administration is going to make a case that they need this warhead particularly, they're going to have to go up to Congress and justify it, uh, and not behind closed doors. This is a, this is a huge change in, uh, in the forces, and I, I think <laughs> the public, uh, the taxpayers who will fund uh, this potential warhead deserve answers about what exactly it is and what it's for. If I can add something to that, uh, if it really is a new weapon, it will certainly need nuclear testing. Uh, which would uh, end the de facto moratorium on nuclear testing that the United States uh, has observed uh, for more than two decades now. We have never ratified the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, but we have been observing a moratorium. Uh, we should have ratified it. We still should ratify it. It is one of the strongest uh, nonproliferation measures uh, that almost... almost. Uh, went into force uh, for the United States as well as everybody else, but it would be an enormous step backwards if we were to resume nuclear testing. And I have to note that we have never certified a new nuclear warhead uh, for the arsenal uh, without any nuclear tests. Some people think that that's possible in principle. I think you have to bet that if the W-93 really is a new weapon, it will need testing, and that will create uh, a severe cost of its own uh, in terms of unraveling the comprehensive test ban. Yeah, thus far the uh, administration said affirmatively that they would not need to test this warhead. Uh, but again, if you haven't actually explained what it is and how it will be built, it's hard to answer that question. Yeah, I'm just curious, just the, the rationale for the the answer to the question about is it a new warhead had something to do with it. Oh, it's a new program designation or something like that. What What is the, I mean, at least from the administration's point of view, what would the rationale be for not saying, I mean, it's a new warhead? What, what's the point? <laughs> well, I guess that w one of the possible points is that if you pretend it might not be new, and you might be able to sustain the argument that it wouldn't require a nuclear test to be certified. If it was simply a modification uh, that was not too drastic of an existing warhead, you might argue plausibly that you could introduce it into the arsenal without nuclear tests. And that's one reason uh, they might want to maintain ambiguity about it. Uh, but again, if it is a new nuclear weapon, no matter what anybody says, uh, I would be very reluctant to believe that it would be certified for use in the arsenal without a nuclear test. And again, that would have uh, a huge negative impact of its own on the nonproliferation regime. We got people to sign on to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty with the argument that the United States would not be able to field a new nuclear warhead without a nuclear test, and therefore there was great value uh, in everybody agreeing to a comprehensive test ban treaty because it would mean no new nuclear weapon types if everybody obeyed it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, Rocco, do we have any more questions? Going to Absolutely. Again? Our next question today comes from Alan Robeck at Rutgers University. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, I work on the climatic effects of nuclear war nuclear winter, and we've had a lot of new recent results that makes the theory very, very sure, and we've done used new climate models. And John, you may remember I talked to you at a IIIS meeting several years ago about this. I was wondering, yeah. has the idea of the humanitarian impacts of the effects on climate, did it get into the Obama administration, and what was their reaction? 
I would say that there was not a, a lot of attention to that in the Obama administration, and I might have been uh, partly responsible for that because my view is that while the climatic and ecological effects of a nuclear war would indeed be devastating, that any political leader who does not believe that a billion immediate deaths is a sufficient uh, argument against using nuclear weapons that leader is probably not going to be persuaded by the notion that there are climatic and ecological effects. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but it has been my view for a long time that uh, the uh, arguments against the use of nuclear weapons are so powerful, uh, even in the absence of any understanding of climatic and ecological effects, that it's hard to imagine whose mind would be changed by uh, a clearer conception of what those effects are. Uh, the, the point is that uh, if you say I'm going to use weapons as a deterrent and you use them and you affect everybody in your country by changing the climate and preventing agriculture, then you're acting like a suicide bomber. What about that? Well, we published a paper on that in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Yeah, thanks for I, that, I, Alan. I, I, I think you're a suicide bomber anyway if you use nuclear weapons because the overwhelming likelihood if nuclear weapons are used is that that will escalate to very large-scale use of nuclear weapons, which will produce these effects, but will also produce a huge number of immediate deaths uh, simply from the effects of blast, radiation, fire, uh, and so on. And so, again... Uh, I think nuclear weapons already amount to something of a suicide pact, and it's not clear to me that the uh, climatic and ecological uh, effects add measurably to what decision makers are uh, going to worry about in respect to the use of nuclear weapons. I would say in the con uh, context of pointing out even a small exchange between India and Pakistan could have global effects is a way to remind the public that this isn't just a problem between the U.S. and, you know, what it sees as its potential adversaries, that there are, there are tensions and conflicts throughout the world that could produce uh, this kind of effect that, you know, has global consequences. And I think it's another way to bring the public back into the debate. Uh, I also think, uh, you know, tying climate change together with nuclear threats is a way to to point out to the public that we have these two existential threats facing the globe, and that's the effect of climate change and the potential for nuclear war. Uh, so you actually have to give equal effort and attention to both of those problems. They, they have solutions. We can prevent catastrophe in, in both areas, but we have to be watching the ball in both spaces. Um, Dr. Robach, thank, thank you for writing for us so often and so well. I really appreciate that. This, this brings up a, you know, a question that I wanted our guests to answer before we go to more audience questions. Of late, the concept of limited nuclear war, escalation to de-escalate, as they call it, has, has been coming up increasingly, and we have a new submarine-launched warhead that's supposedly a small nuclear warhead to use in some limited fashion. I was just hoping, John, if I could start with you, you know, what is your view of the notion of the, even the possibility of a limited nuclear war? And, and, and why does it keep coming up again and again? I, I think being able to limit a nuclear war between countries that have large nuclear arsenals, like the United States uh, and Russia, uh, is a very slim possibility indeed. And the question is, do you really want to bet the future of human civilization on this planet on the low probability that a nuclear war involving countries that possess thousands of nuclear weapons could be kept limited? Uh, I think it's a terrible bet uh, for us to make. I absolutely agree. Uh, a nuclear war is a nuclear war, and the idea that we can contain or control, uh, you know, a small nuclear, you know, back and forth, I, I think there's no evidence to support that theory. Uh, I'd also point out that the remaining Democratic candidates uh, in the race, uh, 
with the exception of Bloomberg, because I don't think he's opined on this yet, but the other remaining candidates have all made clear that they oppose the W-76-2 low-yield warhead uh, that is now being deployed on our submarines and uh, and the other low-yield weapons that the Trump administration has proposed. Uh, so I would imagine that they would take the opportunity to make a an issue out of this idea that the Trump administration has been pushing that we can control a nuclear war. Yeah, well, it would be great if that was more openly and publicly discussed in, in the rest of the campaign because that would be illustrate really there really is a reason to vote. You know, elections matter. Uh, it looks like we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, Rocco, do, do we have anything lined up there? Absolutely. Our next our next question comes from Julian Wiseglass, who is a retired professor from the University of California and a consultant for the elimination of nuclear for elimination of nuclear weapons workshops. Please go ahead. Hello. Thank you very much for this uh, discussion. Um, my question is relates to the issue of climate change and the mass movement that's developed to change that. I don't think you can bring about social change without mass movements, and we have lost the mass movement that that existed in the 70s and 80s against nuclear weapons. You touched on that early in the discussion. Um, from my opinion, my observation, people are terrified of nuclear weapons, and they're not developing a mass movement. And what do you have, see as a strategy for getting people to overcome the fear and get back on the streets to stop and work for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. You know, I'm going to throw that to you first, Alex. What, I mean, uh, I really would like to hear your thoughts on that. Please. I'm a little stumped, frankly. Yeah. So mass movements have been integral uh, to pushing arms control and disarmament. And you saw that uh, in the movement to, get the limited test ban treaty, uh, and then again uh, with the freeze movement in the 80s. I, I, I go back and forth about whether or not I want us to get to the kind of crisis point that we were at in either of those instances to kind of stoke uh, a mass movement that uh, that's not necessarily a good condition for us to be in either. Um, at the same time, I think there are things that we can do to pull people into the conversation. Um, as I said, connecting to things like climate change uh, I think is a good way to do it. Uh, social justice, uh, good governance, uh, good governance, and and controlling the the defense budget. These are things that we can constantly be putting the nuclear issue into those spaces. Uh, we also need to make clear: you're exactly right. People tend to be afraid of nuclear threats and then think there's nothing that can do about it. So they just sort of take a, a nihilistic approach and, and go on mm -hmm. to the next issue. I think what we can do here is, is point out that calling your member uh, really does make a difference. I don't know how many times I can say it, but members of Congress really do respond uh, to what their constituents are saying and asking for. So calling members, organizing in communities, making sure people are aware of the threat uh, through various conversations, whether it's world affairs councils or, or various civic organizations, bringing this issue back up, finding opportunities to discuss this in schools all the way down to, to high school and undergraduate and graduate programs, uh, and trying to make it clear that this threat has not gone away. And while it doesn't feel as omnipresent as it used to in the Cold War, it, it is still at existential threat, but one that we can actually manage. And we have a great playbook of how to manage that, and that's through arms control and nonproliferation agreements. Uh, so hope springs eternal. Let me add a, a couple of remarks. Uh, one is I think we have to uh, get better at educating the public that the threat is not simply a maintenance of an existing nuclear danger status quo. The danger is a new nuclear arms race, which uh, we are uh, busily at the official level fomenting at this moment. Uh, and that is being mirrored by developments uh, on the Russian side, on the Chinese side. Um, we got people excited in the freeze movement because of a widespread understanding that the deployment of SS-20 Soviet missiles in Europe and the deployment of the uh, intended NATO responses, uh, the Pershing-2 and the ground-launch cruise missile, was going to make everybody less safe. It was going to launch 
uh, these developments would launch a whole new phase of the arms race and a whole new phase of nuclear danger. Uh, I think that's what we're facing today with a different set of technologies to be sure, but we are uh, in the process of reigniting uh, a nuclear arms race that is going to make everybody much less safe. And it's going to be essential if we want to energize uh, the public to make that point uh, very clear. Uh, I would argue also in response to the last question that these measures that Alex and I are in favor of are all part of a whole which aims ultimately to get to a point where we could consider a global prohibition of nuclear weapons. In 1997, the National Academy of Sciences Committee on International Security and Arms Control produced a report called The Future of U.S. Nuclear Weapons Policy. And in that report, which was constructed by members of the nuclear weapons community, by members of the NGO community, by top academics. Uh, we had as a member of that committee the, the four-star general who had, uh, until just a couple of years earlier, commanded all of U.S. nuclear forces. And the committee concluded, number one, we should declare uh, no first use of nuclear weapons. Number two, that we should uh, proceed with deeper reductions, which would be made possible, deeper reductions in our nuclear arsenals made possible by the limited role of nuclear weapons, and we should move deliberately toward uh, the ultimate point where we could prohibit nuclear weapons altogether, making a much safer world. This was a set of uh, really establishment experts on nuclear uh, weapons, including uh, a number of people who had been responsible for deploying them and exercising them, saying we should get rid of these things. Uh, that view has also been expressed since by uh, some of the top Republican policymakers in these domains, Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, um, and so on. Uh, this is really the position we need to take, that that's where we're heading. And President Obama made it clear in his prog speech that that's where he thought the country should be heading. Indeed, I think virtually every president uh, since at least JFK has made a statement saying ultimately the goal should be to get rid of nuclear weapons. Uh, so I completely agree with the previous uh, questioner that, that that is the aim, but there are many steps we have to take in the meantime, including no first use, including, including renewing uh, the New START Treaty, uh, including maintaining uh, the effective ban on nuclear weapon tests, and quite a number of others. Uh, thank you, John. That, that sounds like a we're kind of out of time, and it's a wonderful uh, place to end this discussion that uh, the country ought to be heading toward eventual disarmament of the world in, in terms of nuclear weapons. Uh, thanks to everybody for uh, coming and listening here. Thanks particularly to uh, John Holdren and Alex Bell. Uh, thank you for to all of you for taking time out of your day to listen to us talk and perhaps move the ball a little bit in getting the nuclear threat issue at least talked about more in the presidential campaign. Thanks again, again, and come back for our next teleconference. Thank you. Thank you.